Thank you, Warren, and good morning. We are in uh, the book of Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 25, and beginning in verse 26 this morning, I have uh, seven or eight Proverbs. We'll see how far we get in the study this morning. A uh, couple of announcements. First, I want to wish everyone a wonderful Thanksgiving uh, and a blessed time with your families. Uh, for myself, I volunteered to take my grandchildren to the movies, to solo, solo, uh, to see Lyle Lyle the Crocodile. That's about my pace. I'm sure I will enjoy it thoroughly. Um, and then uh, next week, of course, we have Mark. And then after that, two weeks from today, we're going to have Peter Lill back uh, with us in the auditorium. So we're going to combine the classes and don't miss that. Uh, Peter's going to be here to do some research and he has uh, attended, uh, asked to uh, participate in our meetings. So we're looking forward to that. Uh, the Proverbs, where we are in this book, we're e we are going to be choosing difficult ones uh, are very interesting and practical ones from here on out because so many of the Proverbs now uh, deep into this book are repetitive. So uh, that's the basis by which we'll be choosing our verses. So we're going to be skipping some along the way. We begin 25, 26. And before you start there, let me ask you to set a couple of tabs. I'm going to do a word study for you. Uh, I don't know how many of you take notes, but I take notes. I take notes of Mark, and I fill the page. He's got so much content. Uh, and it's really important to follow uh, the logic of a passage. Today I'm going to do a word study, uh, and I will explain that a little bit to you this morning. Uh, as we get there. But if you can take notes, I'm going to give you, there's several passages I'll be referring to, but only two that are really important for you to zone in on and look at. And that 2 Samuel 5, uh, in the course of David's career, 2 Samuel 5 is really an important passage in the Old Testament. Um, and John chapter 4, uh, Dan's sermon on the woman at the well uh, literally brought a lot of thinking uh, and study over the years and crystallized it for me. So we're going to look at uh, 2 Samuel 5, John 4, as we look at this word this morning. All right, we begin with uh, verse 26, a muddied spring, a ruined fountain, a righteous person who gives way. You may have falls, you may have uh, falters before the wicked. We're going to skip 27 and go to 28. A breached uh, city which has no wall, a person whose spirit has no restraint. 26 1 as snow in summer and rain in harvest, so honor is not fit fitting a fool. We're going to skip 26 2 and go to 26 3. A whip for a war horse, a bit for a donkey, a rod for the back of fools. We're going to skip verses 4 through 6 and go to verse 7. 26, 7, lame legs. Now here's your word. It's literally to dangle. 
Most translations have useless, and that's probably what you have, but it's actually dangle, and it's an interesting word picture. And a proverb, a teaching in the mouth of a fool. And finally, our last one, like one who binds a stone in a sling is a person that gives honor to a fool. Well, here's our exposition beginning this morning, Proverbs 25, 26. We have a muddied spring. And here is this interesting word. Your translation reads, gives way. The King James uses falls or falters before the wicked. What a difficult proverb this is. Um, it is the contrast of a righteous man who is or who gives way uh, to specifically the wicked. Uh, he is a compromised righteous man. Uh, and he is contrasted to the trampling feet of a muddied spring. Now, how is that for a contrast? This uh, top line opens the muddied spring. There are only two other occurrences of the muddied spring in this word in all the Bible. It's used uh, by Ezekiel as an image. Let me give those to you because I know you're copiously taking notes. It's Ezekiel 34, 18 and Ezekiel 32, 2. And then here, so only three uses in the Old Testament. Uh, this is in fact a participle, which means we literally translate it making murky, befouling. How's that for uh, a nice English word? Dan, about 20 years ago, gave me for Christmas the Oxford English Dictionary. And uh, befouling is the word uh, here. But I actually didn't get it out of the dictionary. I got it from an archaeologist in looking at this text by the name of E.F.F. F. Bishop. Now, can't you just see in your mind's eye E.F.F. F. Bishop the archaeologist? British, handlebar mustache, monocle, long string, you know, bow tie, EFF Bishop. And EFF Bishop said, to befoul, there's the word, to befoul a water hole as one tracks across a desert is an unforgivable sin to the Bedouin. I think we call that crimes against humanity. But... It's the destruction intentionally of a vital resource for life. Now, here are both figures, the spring and the fountain. They depict the deadly effects of the equivocating righteous person in line two. I think this is a good place to insert James chapter 1 and verse 18. The double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. So that's the idea of this person. In the Proverbs, righteousness, and we've got to define that for ourselves in order to understand this person. Righteousness is a decision of the heart that sets a standard and it's not a standard, which is interesting, according to the Word of God. And here's what I mean. Job was a righteous man. He was righteous by his conduct, the decisions that he made, and his activity out of those decisions. And he came long before the law. We think of... Uh, Joseph, he's down into Egypt. And we think of his righteousness. He didn't have the Scriptures. He didn't have a prophet speaking to him. He had nothing but a couple of dreams. But he set the standard of his conduct 
on righteousness. That's 29.14 uh, of Job. I put on righteousness as my clothing. And Joseph, uh, how could I do such a wicked thing, he tells Potiphar's wife, and sin against God. That thing was a deed that he had made the decision in his heart to conform his life to a standard. And that standard was the Lord Himself. That is righteousness in the Old Testament. It's a decision of the heart that makes its way in life and is displayed in conduct. So, this makes this proverb really difficult, isn't it? Because we have here an equivocating righteous man in the proverb. The word here, uh, to falter, to break down, it's used of a leaning fence, a, a tottering, breaking down fence. And uh, if you push on it, it's going to give way. That's this person. But here is a secret to the proverb that if you have an NIV, you're going to miss because it's not in the translation of an NIV. I don't know why, but it's the word before. Before is a very important word in the proverb. And here it is used in a very rare use of the word. It means hostility. Here's how the lexicon translates this word before. First Chronicles 14, 8. When the Philistines heard that David had been anointed king over all Israel, they went up in full force to search for him, and David heard about it and went out, and here's our word, before. And what's before? Well, David's not standing out in an open field waving on the Philistines and handing out sunflowers and uh, singing with John Lennon, let's give peace a chance. No, that's not before. Before is hostility. It's warfare. That's what David was doing. And uh, what we have is this righteous man who is, gives way. He falters. He breaks down. He fails. So now back to the beginning of the proverb. He is like the muddied spring. And what is that exactly? When you befoul the spring intentionally, well, you ruin its clarity. And you ruin the quality of the spring. And the spring is leaked to the man. What does the proverb teach us? Here it is. You be bold. You be strong. You never equivocate to wickedness. Now, philosophies, different philosophies are one thing. Wickedness and evil is something else. You stand, stand strong. You stand boldly. Uh, I have pointed out to you in the past uh, regarding Job's righteousness. Every man needs to read Job's testimony of his own righteousness. Job 31. Once a year, read it. His standard of righteousness puts us all to shame. Those are decisions that he made in his conduct. You be that person. And that's the proverb. Now, here we come to 2528. Uh, the lack of self-restraint by the fool, we would say, is the comparative image to a broken down wall. The city with a breach wall literally has no wall, we would say. So it's basically defenseless. In the ancient Near East, the decisive characteristic of a city was an outside protective wall. Line two, notice this is a person and it uses this word spirit. 
we would say demeanor. This is the characteristic of the person's demeanor. The spirit is a figure which represents the entire person. We just had two weeks ago uh, the illustration of the hand. And the hand represented the entire person. So that's the idea here. The spirit of the man is the entire person. Here's the illustration from the Scriptures. They're always the best illustration. Genesis 25, 27. The spirit of two twin brothers. The boys grew up. Esau became a skillful hunter, a man of the open country, while Jacob was at home among the tents. The contrast of the spirit or demeanor of the two men. How about Samson compared to the weeping prophet Jeremiah? Quite a bit different. A big gap there. Look at this word restraint. Literally to prevent someone from doing something. It's used by Sarai to Abraham. Genesis 16.2 telling her husband that the Lord, and here is our word, restrained. He has restrained me from having children. So the proverb is depicting the fool who drives. What is that? The characteristics of his life. That's his passions. And it's likened to no fortifications in a city. What is that? No restraint. We would say, that person's out of control. And we see it all the time, don't we? Lust, greed, temper, which can evolve into acts of jealous rage. That's Genesis 4. That was Cain murdering his brother Abel. When a society, when a government doesn't handle corrupt people with handcuffs and weaponry from qualified officers and put them in prison or in the back of a squad car. This is what your society becomes. It becomes a breached wall, an open wall. And the city and its citizenry are vulnerable. That's what the Proverbs teach. And the individuals that are the citizenry are unprotected. And that is foolishness according to the Proverbs. Now that's the proverb. We're not finished. I want to show you this word. This word is breached in the proverb. I'm going to alliterate it for you to follow along. Three English radicals that make up the three letters of the word. P-R-S. That may be easier for you to follow. The word means breached or broken down or broken out. That's traditionally how the word is used. 2 Kings chapter 14. Verse 13, used of Joash going to Jerusalem and breaching the wall. Breaking the wall down. But this is an interesting word. It not only deals with broken down walls, it has a spiritual dimension to it. And I want to explain that to you this morning. In the book of Proverbs, we came across this same word, breached, uh, P-R-S, in Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 10. It was in the proverb of honoring the Lord with your wealth, and your barns would be filled with plenty, and your vats would be, and here's our word, breached. Now, the NIV translates that brimmed over. The King James says burst out. That's the better translation. 
It is the idea of something coming from the inside out. Now, I want you to look at 1 Samuel, uh, 2 Samuel chapter 5. And one of the most remarkable chapters in the Old Testament. Because this is a chapter of firsts in the history of Israel. Let me show that to you. In verses 1 through 5, all the tribes of Israel came to make David king at Hebron and anointed him. So now we've got a second king, a new king, and he has been recognized by all of Israel. We've got the king. Now in verses 6 through 10, he goes up and he takes the ancient city of Salem the city of David called Jerusalem. And that was where Melchizedek, the king, priest, Melech, king, priest, Sedek, Melchizedek, the king of righteousness, resided. Now we have a king and we have a capital. In verses 11 through 16, we're provided the historic data regarding his residence, the royal line at that time. Then in verse 17, I want you to watch this. He engages for the first time as king over all Israel, the Philistines. He had already beaten their champion in 1 Samuel 17. But now he's going to face them as an army, as, as a foe. And that is what we have. The Philistines obviously knew him to be a formidable challenger, defeating their monster Goliath. And so they decided, we better get him early. Let's get him now before this little cub grows into a powerful lion. But you see, they had no idea what they were dealing with. This wasn't Saul, the equivocating Saul. No, this is a man where the Spirit of God hovered over. This is a man who had the heart of God. And so, that type of a man what does he do? He goes directly to the Lord. Verse 19, he inquires of the Lord. Shall I go up against the Philistine? Will you give them into my hand? Now, as you meditate on the Scriptures over time, things get clearer and clearer. And I thought about this verse because later on, David is going to write for us Psalm 2. And Psalm 2 is a coronation hymn for his son Solomon to take the throne. It's all, all prophetic. We see the Lord Jesus and we see God offering him the kingdom of the earth. What's interesting is he inquires of the Lord here, shall I go up against the Philistine? Will you give them into my hand? Because Psalm 2, verse 7, David writes that the Father says to the Son, ask of me and I will give you the nations. David's asking, will you give me the Philistines? And the Lord says, yes. Now look at the name of this place where they met, verse 20. It is Baal, that is Small cap, B-A-A-L. Nothing significant about that. Baal, meaning Lord, and then our word, P-R-S. Breach. Baal, Perazim. There it is. But it's not like our proverb where you break from the outside into the wall. David's going to explain this to us. 
It is actually a breaking out. Think of a dam. Where is the force in the dam? It's behind the wall. It's in the water. And when that dam is breached, what happens? An explosion occurs and the water cascade down to create havoc. That's the idea in the way that, da that David is using it. Baal Perazim. It's an outburst. In other words, inside out. Look at the way David describes this. Verse 20. David defeated them. That's the man. That's you and me. Ordinary, common, you and me. Now, look how he defines the power of what happened. He says, the Lord. See, behind you and behind me is the power of the Lord. That's who's breaching. David is just like you. He just suits up and shows up. It is God's force and God's power. That's important what this Word is teaching us. The Lord. What is that? That's the name of the burning bush. Back to Exodus chapter 3 again. And we talked about it last time we were together. Remember that, what that name did? That burning bush? Take your hand. Put it in your cloak. Pull it out. It's leprous. Put it back in, it's normal. Take your staff, throw it on the ground, it becomes a serpent. Pick it up again, it becomes a staff. That is a name that changes things. How so? Well, how about this? He breaks Egypt. He conquers the Pharaoh. He drowns their charioteers. What does this name do? This name changes history. What happens? to David with the Philistines. He breaks them by the power of the Lord. And history is changed. No more Philistines poking their index finger in your eye. No, we have a new man ruling Israel. And look how David describes this. Using our word, Proverbs 25, 28, breached, broken out, the Lord has broken out upon my enemies before me like an outburst of water. Not from the outside. No. This is the inside. Now what's the relevance to this? Well, here it is. In Genesis chapter 38, you have the birth of Judah's two twin sons with Tamar. And the text says that as... She was giving birth. One of the boys in birth put his hand out. And so the midwife ties a little scarlet thread around the wrist and declares, this is the firstborn. This one came out first. Then he draws his hand back. And suddenly, I love the way the King James says this. It's Genesis 38, 29. Then it happened. In other words, drum roll, and here's the bright light, and here's the event. Suddenly, behold, his brother breached PRS. And the midwife, so shocked by this event, she shouted out, What a breach! And guess what they named him? PRS. Breach. His name was Perez, the second born. Where did David defeat the Philistines? 2 Samuel 5. Baal Perazim, the Lord of the breakout. How important is this word to you and me? Well, Matthew sums it all up for us in his genealogy. Matthew chapter 1. Judah was the father of Perez and Zerah. No, wait a minute. That's not right. Matthew's not right. That can't be right. No, it was Zerah 
first. Remember, he got the scarlet thread. But Matthew knows more than I do. You see, Matthew understands what God has been teaching in the book of Genesis. That it's never the natural heir, it's always the second born that is a part of the line that we're following. And so, it's not Ishmael the firstborn. It's Isaac the secondborn. It's not Esau the firstborn. It's Jacob the secondborn. It's not Zerah the firstborn. It is Perez the secondborn. And so Matthew understood that. And so he puts it in proper order for us. Judah was the father of Perez. And then Zerah by Tamar. Perez was the father of Hezron. Hezron the father of Ram. Ram the father of Amenadab. Amenadab the father of Nashon. Nashon the father of Salmon. Salmon the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. Boaz was the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. Obed was the father of Jesse. And Jesse was the father of David. There it is. The yellow brick road from the garden across the pages of the Old Testament to Christ. But it even gets better than that. You see, what that tells us is it doesn't make any difference if you're from Maine or Minnesota or Mississippi, or Montana. Geographically, this is your line. This is where you're from. This is your ancestry of royalty. This is who you're connected to. I have a black and white photograph in my study. It's my mother on the left side, my father on the right side, and there's the fireplace in the middle. My two brothers are laying down on the floor posing. The dog is in the middle. Where am I? I wasn't born yet. Now that's my family here, but this is where I'm from. This is where you're from. This is our line. And this is a line of royalty. This is your origin. This is your history. We all have a different Damascus road. But this is where we are all from spiritually. Now, the New Testament doesn't use the word PRS, breached. It uses a different word. It uses the word power. Uh, but it has the same idea, the same context. The power coming forth from the inside out. Now, that's why I wanted you to look at John 4. John 4, our Lord Jesus is at the well. Remember, it's 4.14. He's engaged with this Samaritan woman. And he says, whoever drinks of the water that I give him will never thirst again. Now, notice carefully the second sentence. I had never thought of this before until Dan's exposition. Look at this. He changes the image. He changes from water and wells to the source, a spring. A different definition altogether. A spring that he describes as coming up or coming forth in power to the surface. Here's what he says. The water I give him will become. Now remember, become is not A, it's not B, it's in between. It's a transition word. So, what we have is something that starts off and then takes over. 
That's the idea of becoming. And Jesus says, we'll become in Him a fountain springing. See that? Fritz Reinecker, the Greek grammarian, described this participle springing as leaping from a crouch position up. Now, what do you do with a water well? You dig for it, don't you? You have to dig a well, but not a spring. No one ever digs for a spring. You dig for water, but not a spring. A spring way down below the surface, and it springs up by its own power. And that's what happens. The power from inside out, Jesus says, will become in Him. That's the New Testament power, that's the Old Testament breach. The image is one and the same. The new man has by the power of the Holy Spirit breached the old man, the natural man, the old you. The new man, if you will, has overtaken the old. And now, fortified with His power, he steps forward. Let me tell you how Paul describes that. It's 2 Corinthians 5.17. If any man be in Christ Jesus, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Because, behold, all things now are new. You are made new. Why? For His plan. For His purpose. For His glory's sake. And He has brought you forth in power to display that. Born again by the Spirit's force. Now, now just look at you. Look at you, where you are, right here, in this place, in this time. Believer's Chapel. You've lost husbands. You've lost wives. You've suffered the death of children. You've had, you have entered the marketplace, the world out there, and you've had enemies left and right. Arrows shot at you from every direction. Lied to, lie about, misrepresented, attacked in one form or another. And yet, here you are today. Here you are, before His Word, listening to His voice from the Scriptures. My all-time favorite quote from Charles Haddon Spurgeon comes from his sermon, Esther's Exaltation or Who Knoweth. It was preached on April 27, 1884. The context of the quote is when a man or a woman is committed to God's plan and purpose. And here is what Mr. Spurgeon said. That man, that woman, that person will live out his day and accomplish the divine design. The more resistance he experiences, the more surely will his life work be achieved. Look at you. Through many dangers, toils, and snares, you already have come. Loneliness, loss, heartache, heartbreak. Never sent by God to destroy. Sent by God to make you strong. Who you really are. You see, the new man, the breached man, the man of power, the woman of power, that is the new life. And now thrown into spiritual warfare. You know they say that the most dangerous time in an occupied territory is right after a war. Because the conquerors are all walking up and down the streets 
and through the buildings and through the residences, and they have weapons loaded at all times. It's very dangerous. Lots of people get killed by accident. Because why? The temperament of the age, the battle that they had just gone through, they don't shoot a bullet in the air and holler out, halt, in the name of the law. No. They have come through warfare. They are thinking in terms of battle, and they pull their weapon and they shoot. You are in spiritual warfare. Now made ready. Now engaged. Now overcoming. And you're tough. You're resilient. God made you that way. You are mature and maturing. You are becoming. You're transitioning. No longer the softy. Now, the hardened Christian believer who trusts God and has learned to trust God in season, out of season, feeding on His Word. That's why you're here. Because you know this is nourishment. This is the power of your life. You are the overcomer. You were by nature, and you now are by activity. You overcome. So sickness, illness, doesn't defeat. You overcome all the way to the last breath of your life. And you'll enter into His presence as a conqueror, as a victor. You ran the race of life. You finished the course. You accomplished the task for which He assigned you. So what was the proverb about the befouled spring? Be strong. Be bold. God has raised you up for a time such as this, for a purpose, for a reason. You think you stay at the red light too long? Don't worry. The green light's coming. He's got a plan, and He's preparing you for the next thing. And the next thing will be His will for you. You made powerful, made strong, made courageous, by and through the Word of God with the Spirit, you are the overcomer. I've run out of time. Let's close in a word of prayer. Thank You, Father, for our time of study this morning. You send this message of Your Word to Your people for a purpose. To remind them of who they are. David defeated the Philistines at Baal Perazim, but David never said, I did it. He said, It was the Lord all the way. That's our testimony. That's who we are. More than conquerors in the power of the Spirit of God. So, Lord, now, by Your grace and by Your mercy, strengthen us, refortify us in the Word, by the power of the Spirit, to live aggressively for You each and every day. And it is to that end that we live to glorify our Master, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray.